Hey there, welcome to another episode of Mike's Collection. I'm Mike, and the part of my collection that I'm going to be talking about today is the newest wave of Masters of the Universe Classics figures produced by Super 7. And this is going to be the second to last wave of Masters of the Universe Classics figures that we're going to see for the foreseeable future. So if you're not familiar with Classics already, just a very quick overview. Um, Mattel started releasing this line of Masters of the Universe Classics uh, in around 2009 or so. And all the figures are sculpted by the, uh, the Four Horsemen, who are sort of famous uh, toy sculptors. And they've been making these really incredible toys based on the original 1980s Masters of the Universe line. And Mattel did that for several years. And then for the last couple of years, they've passed off the licensing to a smaller company, Super 7, who has produced a few waves of classics themselves. But in 2020, Mattel is planning on relaunching Masters of the Universe figures in a new scale, and they're going to release them to retail. And so they don't want to be competing with themselves. So from my understanding, they've pulled the license back from Super 7, and the classics line is now ending. And we can you know, prepare to get, start receiving that new scale of figures uh, later this year. So uh, Super 7 is going out with a bang, though, because uh, there's one more wave of figures based on the Filmation cartoon coming out. Uh, a lot of people have already received those. Uh, mine are on uh, pre-order, and I'm still waiting for them to show up. But that will be the absolute last figures from Super 7 for Masters of the Universe. Um, and this wave came out right around the same time, and uh, they showed up on my doorstep uh, the other day. So this wave here, this is based on the live action Masters of the Universe movie from 1987. Now, uh, just to give you a little bit of history on that movie, and by the way, I didn't spend a ton of time researching this, so don't take this as, you know, fact. Take it with a grain of salt. This is mostly just kind of me um, remembering how th things all went down. But when I was a kid, I was a big fan of Masters of the Universe, the toys and the comic books that came with the toys, the cartoon. I loved all that stuff when I was a kid. And Masters of the Universe started coming out in 1983, and it was, like, huge in 83, 84, 85. And so Hollywood decided, let's make a movie of this super hot property. And in 1987, they made a live-action movie. And Masters of the Universe fans, I think, have always had mixed feelings about this movie. Like, it's kind of cool, and I think we've kind of accepted it more and more over the years. And I, like, I even liked it as a kid. Like, I, I watched it multiple times. It was just confusing. Because as a kid, you know, I didn't know, you know, the ins and outs of Hollywood. I thought when they're going to make a movie of this cartoon, it should be like the cartoon. I wasn't taking into consideration budgets and, uh, and things of that nature. So the movie we got was pretty different than what I, what I and I think most other kids were expecting like they cast Dolph Lundgren who played Ivan Drago and Rocky IV as He-Man and that's pretty perfect he's this big muscular blonde guy I was already a fan of him so having him as He-Man was great the costume for He-Man wasn't quite right but that's a that's a small gripe but the things that were most confusing about that movie was that the cartoon took place on this fictional world of Eternia which was kind of fantasy and science fiction mixed together. There was dinosaurs and flying spaceships and old castles and wizards. And it was, it was just crazy. And there was a huge cast of characters. You know, every kid had their favorites. Merman is my favorite. So this movie, it started out on Eternia and very quickly moved to Earth. Why? For budget reasons, because they could film in practical locations rather than have to create these fantastical uh, science fiction locations. So yeah, He-Man traveled to Earth along with a small band of heroes and villains. And uh, yeah, the whole place, it was you know kind of more of a fish out of water story, this little battle taking place. And it just wasn't what we wanted. And even a lot of the well-known characters like Skeletor's henchmen that you'd expect to see, like Merman or Trapjaw or Triclops, they were replaced by these brand new characters. And that was also very confusing. Like, if you've got this beloved cast of characters, why would you create brand new ones and ignore the ones that everybody likes? Um, one of the uh, henchmen that did carry over from the toy line and cartoon to the movie was Beastman. But where Beastman was kind of Skeletor's main henchman who had lots of dialogue in the cartoons and everything, he was just like kind of a grunting beast in the movie. 
And so that wasn't quite what we expected either. Um, the little wizard sidekick to He-Man, who everybody knows is Orko in the cartoons on the toy line, he was replaced by this odd little dwarf called Gwildor. And we were just like, why why Gwildor? Why not Orko? We just, the changes just didn't make sense. But, like I said, over the years, that movie, um, I've softened on it. I think the fandom in general has kind of softened on it. We appreciate it for what it was. We maybe understand the choices they made a little bit more. For example, Orko was, uh, he was always levitating and floating around in the cartoon. For them to have accomplished that on screen, you know, that would have been tough to pull off. It probably would have required some sort of, uh, you know, computer graphics that they didn't have back in 1987. Um, so they came up with this other character who could just walk around on the ground. Now, I still would say you could still make that character Orko. Maybe the costume didn't have to be exactly right. I wouldn't care if he wasn't floating around. As long as he was Orko, I would have been happy. I wasn't a fan of Gwildor. But, uh, whatever. That's what we got. So, especially as kids who watched that movie grew up, we kind of wanted toys of the way the characters looked in that movie. Because even though it wasn't what we expected, some of the costumes and stuff from that movie were still pretty cool. And even back then, at the height of Masters of the Universe popularity in the 80s, they only made a handful of toys for this to- for this movie, and they didn't make He-Man or Skeletor, the main hero and the main villain. They made a couple of these new henchmen, but that was it. And they've never made figures of them since. And even when Masters of the Universe got revived in like 2002 and had a big comeback, and then when it came back again with the start of the Classics line in like 2009, the top of people's want list for a long, long time has been figures based on the live action movie and my understanding is Mattel could not do it there was some legal rights tied up with the movie company that made the movie um, which I think is was canon films and I I don't know if they still exist I don't I don't know what the legal issue was it might have been actors uh, license uh, likenesses that they didn't have the right to make figures of whatever the case Mattel had been asked repeatedly and they answered repeatedly that they could not produce figures based on the live action movie. Now, one little uh, workaround that uh, was able to happen when uh, Mattel was making these classics figures is they were able to make classics versions of the few characters that had been released as toys in the 80s. So we did get Sorod here, who was one of the new henchmen introduced in the live action movie. And we also get Blade. So we got these two characters based on the movie, but still no He-Man, no Skeletor, and it seemed like it was never going to happen. Now, when Super 7 took over the license, they made it a mission to try and get these figures made. And they found a workaround. So what I understand is that they couldn't get the actors' likenesses or the likenesses from the movie, but what they could do is they could go to the guy that designed the costume and did the concept sketches, a guy named William Stout, and they could license his artwork to make figures based on the artwork, not on the actual movie. So these toys, even though it doesn't say anywhere on the package, um, when these were being advertised to us as pre-orders and stuff, they were known as the William Stout Collection. Um, So yeah, these are based on William Stout's artwork. And uh, yeah, thank goodness for William Stout. I'm not familiar with that guy at all, but... uh, Whatever deal Super 7 was able to work out, we finally have figures that are pretty close to what we saw on screen in the movie. So this one here that you're looking at is God Skeletor. And uh, if you're watching this review of these figures, I assume you've seen this movie. So Skeletor, when he finally gets all powered up at the end of the movie, he becomes a golden god. And this is that figure. There's some artwork on the back and a little bio. And here you'll see a cross-sell for the rest of the figures in the line, as well as the figures from the final animated wave I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So there's God Skeletor in the package. Here is one of the henchmen, Karg, in package. And again, some original artwork there on the side, bio on the back. I apologize for my dog, Casey, barking in the background there, but uh, hopefully she doesn't go too nuts. Here is Skeletor in his standard outfit. So they call him Dark Despot Skeletor. 
So, again, some nice artwork on the back and a bio as well. And lastly, Rebel Leader He-Man. Some artwork on the back and a bio. So I wanted to record this segment of the video where I could show you them all in package right now because honestly, I don't have time to do this whole review video at this particular moment in time, but I've had these figures for two days and I've been dying to open them, but I wanted to be able to film them in package before I did that. So now that I've shot this introduction, I can open these up, enjoy them, and I'll film the rest of the video later and you'll be none the wiser. So uh, yeah, let's pop back once I've got them open. Okay, so I've got my figures all opened up here now. So let's take a look at them outside of the packaging. So first up, we've got Rebel Leader He-Man. So you can see here, he's got uh, some very nice sculpted detail in his armor there, his shoulder pads, shin, shin guards, wrist guards there. And there's a nice kind of, they're like sculpted in black with a nice gold wash over them, which gives them kind of a nice patina look. Now here's his head. Now you'll see, I think it's a pretty good head. It's pretty close. Um, to what you know what we got on screen and if they didn't outright tell us that this that they didn't have the rights to Dolph Lundgren's um, appearance and that this figure was based on the concept art and not the actual actor um, I wouldn't have been any of the wiser I would have just assumed that this was the best Dolph Lundgren head they could give us sure it's not a spot-on uh, look like for Dolph Lundgren but it's pretty close and let's be honest like a lot of toys based on actors actors likenesses don't look any better than this um now these days especially with like the face printing technology hasbro's been using on say like their star wars black and some of their marvel legends um we do know they can get really good likenesses of actors but uh yeah i would have been fine with this head right here now they did actually give us another head so this is the secondary head and he's got a much more kind of like pronounced cheeks and stronger jawline and I find it's a little cartoonier but this head is supposed to be better representative of the actual concept art so if you look at the William Stout artwork this is the head that's supposed to match that design a little better and I think Super 7 just went ahead and gave us this extra head to come a little bit closer to Dolph Lundgren which I appreciate because I like this head better and this is the one I will be keeping on him now I do have a Dolph Lundgren here based on his uh, Ivan Drago character from Rocky. So you can see, even with the Dolph Lundgren head, would it have been any better or that much different? I don't really think so. I'm pretty content with this head right here. So, so let's take a look at him. Now, as far as his uh, body design goes, most Masters of the Universe figures um, from the Classics line have used the same buck like the same uh, body over and over again just with some extra parts now this appears to be a whole new buck it's not as not as buff actually as previous figures which i actually really like it's a little more realistic so it matches the fact that this is supposed to be based on a real guy otherwise the articulation's uh, pretty standard from what we've seen with all these masters of the universe classics figures we've got the ab crunch there the elbows the wrists the knees, the ankles. So there's no double jointed elbows or knees or anything here like we get on uh, Marvel Legends and what, whatnot. But uh, this is what we'd expect with uh, the Masters of the Universe Classics figure. So I'm glad that they haven't really changed things up too much. And he's got a cloth cape here, which hangs nicely, looks good. As far as accessories go, so he came with the, uh, the alternate head there, but he also has his power sword and then he has this pistol, which can be holstered on his hip here. And he's got a dagger that can be sheathed on the other side. And then he's got this little knife, which I didn't know what to do with it until somebody on Instagram told me about this little hiding spot there. Because you really can't even see that that's a hole there until it was pointed out to me. So there you go. You can store his knife in there. It's just kind of, it just kind of sits in that hole. It's not like a tight fit or anything, but at least it's nice that it can be stored on the figure. Because I'm not a fan when 
characters come with so many extra weapons that you just end up throwing them in a box somewhere because they can't hold them all themselves. And as for the uh, the sword, it can be sheathed as well. Um, so we flip his cape up here, and you see he's got the sheath there. So it tucks in like like so, and so it's intended to go through. Uh, I think up here somewhere, or like you see this little clip that would hold the handle in place and then that would sheath into the bottom of that. So that's pretty cool too. So overall, I think this is a pretty great figure. I like the proportions of it. It looks like He-Man from the movie and I think it was worth the wait. Now let's just bring one of the, uh, oh, there goes the sword. Let's just bring up one of the classic He-Man here to compare. So for starters, I'm going to bring out Thunder Punch He-Man. So this is one of Mattel's Masters of the Universe Classics He-Man. They did him in a number of different outfits. They did the kind of the standard, uh, you know, gray and red um, body armor. And then they did the battle damage body armor He-Man. So here he is. This is Thunder Punch He-Man. So this one, that's what most of the classics He-Man kind of look like. Then I've got another He-Man here. Now this is Snake Armor He-Man, also from Mattel's Classics line. Now this was based on a look he had in the 2002 reboot of He-Man. So he's got a little bit more of like an anime vibe to him here. And then we've got this one also produced by Super 7. But this is the Filmation He-Man. So this is my, uh, my favorite one here. So this is based on the cartoon look. So there we go. And since I've got him handy, I can even bring out um, Mythic Legion's kind of homage to He-Man. So this isn't officially He-Man, but he's, he's inspired by him. So there you go. We got a nice little crew here. And these figures are all great in their own way. And depending on what kind of dis display you want to have, a movie display, a, you know, a display based on the old toy line, based on the 2000 toy line, based on the cartoon, these guys all have a spot in my collection. I think they're awesome. And yeah, I'm really glad that Super 7 was able to get us this William Stout He-Man. So next up, let's take a look at Karg outside of the packaging. So Karg is one of the brand new characters that was created for the 1987 movie. He had no prior history in the cartoon or the toy line or the comic books. And of the new characters they created, um, I really liked Sorod, the lizardy guy. Um, I really didn't care that much for Blade or Karg. Um, but I had, like I said, there's a lot of things with that movie. I've kind of softened on them over the years. And now I actually kind of like Karg. He's still kind of weird looking with this like a kind of creepy, kind of bat-like face. And I say bat-like because if you see his ears here, he's got these kind of crazy bat ears coming through this gigantic quaff of hair, which seems kind of ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it's definitely different from any of the other characters in the line. So uh, at least I appreciate that, that they took a, took a risk and went with something totally different. They didn't try and give us some like half-assed merman or something. This guy is completely his own thing. And I'm actually kind of surprised with characters like this, that they didn't later work them into the, uh, like the cartoon or do a, a cartoon version of him for the toy line. Pretty much he was just associated with the movie and that's it. And, you know, he didn't even get a figure from that, uh, those three figures they created based on the movie, which was just Sorod, Blade, and Gwildor. So, yeah, we've never had a Karg figure up until a couple of years ago when, I was kind of, I had a little trouble getting him to stand, but I think he's okay there. So, a couple of years ago, Mattel produced a Karg figure, and I'll bring him out here. And this is the exact same figure as far as the sculpting goes. The only thing that's changed is the paint with one other minor sculpting um, difference. You'll see here, he's got a claw hand. And so this one here, and I've got him holding his knife, which is, I don't know if he'd really hold a knife in the hook, if that makes any sense. But uh, where I was talking before about how I like figures to be able to hold their accessories, uh, Karg does not have anywhere, he doesn't have a sheath or anything for this little blade he comes with. So... You can either put this in his hand or his gun, or you can try and put it in his hook. Now, the new Karg has that same knife in a different color. Now, the reason I don't have it in his hook is because that's the part that's different. So this guy's got kind of a standard Captain Hook looking hook, whereas Karg has this 
it's a little bit of a finer point with these jagged little um, edges on it and this is what it looked like from the movie so i appreciate that super 7 went the extra mile and even though this figure is like 99 percent of repaint they did go ahead and sculpt a new hook to make it more film accurate but with that new hook i don't think it's going to hold on to this blade the way the other uh, figures does so so that's not an option and i prefer to display him with the uh, gun so this karg's knife is just going to go in the uh, spare parts bucket probably never to be seen again so yeah so how was mattel able to produce this karg well like super 7 i think they did some legal finagling and karg had appeared in a comic book and they based this look off of the comic book design which is why his colors are so crazy. I don't know why, but in the comic book, he appeared like this with green skin and a blue costume. Now, maybe that was a comic came out in the lead up to the movie and they hadn't finalized his look yet, or sometimes things just get lost in translation. But this figure of Karg that Mattel gave us was based on that comic book appearance alone. They couldn't do the movie look. And I was happy to just get Karg then. I knew I was never a big fan of the character, and when this toy came, I was happy to get him, but I didn't think it was a great toy. I was like, all right, I've got a Karg in my collection now. That's cool. It wasn't until I got this figure that I realized why I didn't like that one. It's because that one sucks compared to this. This figure, even though it's the same thing, it's amazing what a different paint job can do to bring out the detail and make you appreciate a figure more. This one is just far superior to this goofy looking one. So I'm glad I can banish this one to the back of my shelf. And I can bump this guy up to the front. Because he looks pretty nice. I really like this gold on black paint job. The uh, the cape there looks very regal. Uh, there's not much to re report as far as the uh, articulation or anything goes. It's pretty standard. This uh, loincloth kind of thing here. It's soft goods. So it doesn't hinder his movement. You can see he can still do some like splits and stuff. So you can still get him in some good poses. Now, one thing I will say about this figure and the other ones I'm going to show you in a minute is they do seem to use the more standard buck from Master Universe Classics. So where they slimmed He-Man down, they didn't do that for Karg. If anything, they beefed him up because he was not a big muscle-bound character in the movie. Sure, he had some kind of thick armor on, but you could tell his, uh, you know, he wasn't like this big beefy guy underneath all that armor. Whereas this one, you know, he's almost busting out of this armor and it makes him look substantially larger. So this guy, like I said, I'm having a little trouble getting him to stand upright, but that's because he's just out of the packaging. I'm sure if I mess around with him a little bit, I'll find a good stance for him so he'll be able to stand on my shelf okay. But Karg, it's my least favorite of this batch, but it's still a very cool figure. And if you're a Karg fan, I'd say it's a must have. So here's a little group shot of all the movie henchmen together. Um, it's kind of a shame that we don't have a Beast Man based on the William Stout collection artwork because there is William Stout artwork for Beast Man that can be found online. So you'd think Super 7 could have produced that figure as well. Um, same as Evil Lynn. She doesn't qual fall into the same category as these henchmen, I don't think. She was more Skeletor's right-hand man. But I really did like Eva Lynn's look in the movie, so it's a shame we didn't get her either. But uh, yeah, it's pretty cool to have all these guys grouped together. And to be honest, this Beast Man, he so uh, doesn't look like his movie counterpart that it might actually make more sense to uh, replace him with, with Grizzlor here. That looks more like movie Beast Man as far as I'm concerned. So there you go. There's the movie henchman. So next up, let's take a look at the standard Skeletor, or as the packaging refers to him, Dark Despot Skeletor. So this is him in his kind of traditional outfit that he's wearing through the bulk of the movie. So you can see it's got some soft rubber bits here. Unlike He-Man, he doesn't have a cloth cape. He's got a rubber cape here, but it's, it's soft and can move around. You can see here he's got like a cloak or tunic or whatever. It's also soft good. It doesn't uh, hinder any of his posability, so you can still get him to do, you know, the splits or whatever, get him in some pretty wide stances. Now, this is a really nice figure. Probably the best thing about the live-action movie was Frank Langella as Skeletor. And, yeah, he looks great here. Now, I've got the light of my tablet shining on him, so I don't know if we're getting the detail there. He's kind of washed out. 
So maybe let me turn that off and we'll try and get capture some of the detail. But while I do still have the light on, maybe we should take a look at the armor here. And you can see, kind of like with He-Man, it was done in black and then it's got this kind of gold wash to give it a patina look here. Here's his Havoc staff, which has got that goat head on there. That also looks great. Lots of nice sculpting in there. Like, it's just a beautiful figure. Look at all these little details here. Each one of these patterns has like a different image in there. You can see skulls, bones. I don't know, it looks like almost like a little devil or a cat or something there. I don't know, really nice details. So yeah, it is a really nice figure. Um, for accessories, so he's got the staff. He's got his own power sword. And he came with a cosmic key. Now, if you've seen the movie, let me get him to stand there. The cosmic key was kind of the MacGuffin that they had to chase through the whole movie. It was kind of this weird science fiction synthesizer that allowed them to open gates to other worlds. And uh, yeah, so Gwildor had this thing, and Skeletor was chasing him down. Now, uh, Mattel actually gave us a prior version of the cosmic key that came with their Masters of the Universe Classics Gwildor figure. But it wasn't screen accurate. It was oversized and brightly colored. So even though this is just a little trinket, it's still pretty nice to get a film accurate uh, cosmic key with the Skeletor. All right, so let's uh, flick the light off here so we can see if we can capture some of the detail on his face. All right, so here we go. Hopefully we can pick up some of that a little bit more. Yeah, it's just a really nice head sculpt and pretty accurate to what we got on screen. And from what I understand, like He-Man, this isn't actually based necessarily on the look on the actual screen. It's based on the concept art. Now, fortunately, in the case of Skeletor and Karg, and would have been the case on probably any of the other creatures, had Super 7 been able to maintain the license and continue to produce these figures, you wouldn't even know the difference because the beasts look so much um, similar in their concept art to what we got on screen. It's probably only the human characters that would have suffered a little bit in that regard. So yeah, this Skeletor, there's no way um, I think you'd ever know that this wasn't based on the actual film because it looks awesome. So there you go. That's regular Skeletor. Now let's take a look at God Skeletor. Actually, before I give Skeletor the boot, um, I want to just do a little bit of a comparison of him with some other Skeletors as well. So here is one of Mattel's classic Skeletor. So this is Skeletor in his kind of uh, his battle damage armor. And this isn't the head that came with this figure. This head is a bonus piece that actually came with a whole other different character called a Demo Man. But that head is based on Skeletor's appearance in the mini comics that used to come packaged with toys in the 80s. And I much preferred it to the kind of friendlier, rounder head that came on this figure originally. So there we go. Um, here I've got the animated Skeletor figure from, um, from Super 7 that just came out last year. And I think it is an awesome figure. It was very high on my best of list last year. And if you haven't watched my video with my best of 2019, be sure to go back and check that out. And what else have I got? We got a Skeletor here from the new adventures. So this is Skeletor's kind of science fiction look. And just since we did it for He-Man, we'll bring up the, uh, the Mythic Legion's Skeletor homage here. So there you go. Nice little group of Skeletors. And lastly, we have Golden God Skeletor. So, at the end of the movie, Skeletor got a hold of the cosmic key and he was able to give himself godlike powers and he transformed into this crazy design. Now, uh, it's one of those things, again, that seemed kind of weird as a kid. Like, why would Skeletor wear this crazy looking helmet and everything? But it's probably the costume from the movie that I most wanted to see in figure form because it's so far removed from anything we've got in the action figure line like as cool as that last Skeletor I showed you was it was Skeletor in kind of his standard robes and if I could only have one Skeletor in my collection I still think I would choose the animated Skeletor over that one but this guy here it's practically a different character in that it's such a crazy departure from Skeletor's 
typical appearance. And yeah, I think it is awesome. Like, look at the details in this helmet here. It's got kind of the bat wings on the back there. It looks like something out of like Jack Kirby's cosmic Marvel or DC books. Like, he looks like he could be from New Gods or the Eternals or something. Just awesome. Now, most of the figure is actually the same as the other Skeletor. It just might not look it because of the, you know, sharp, you know, bright gold colored paint. But let's bring the other Skeletor up here for a second. So yeah, so here's the original Skeletor. So you can see here the, uh, the chest plates like the same, the belts the same. Although the Golden God Skeletor has this added soft piece that hangs in the in the front. Now, as far as those kind of tassels that hang in the front, they both have those. The uh, the cape design with kind of the hanging, looks like a hood almost over here, they both have that. So yeah, they're pretty much the same figure throughout. It's really just the new head. Even the, uh, the Havoc staff there, you can see that's the same accessory. This one just has a golden paint job on it. But yeah, that's the same same piece that we get there. So these two are a really nice complement to one another, and I think they're going to look amazing once they're displayed on my shelf next to each other. And I, yeah, I think all these figures in this line are great, but I think Golden God Skeletor is my favorite. I kind of thought it might be. I kind of knew it was going to be a toss-up between the two Skeletors. But uh, yeah, this one I just absolutely love. I love in his face there, kind of like his blacked out eyes. It just looks really cool. Now maybe, I don't know if it'll wash it right out, but I'm going to try and just get a close-up of him with the light on as well. So here we see him under the spotlight. That really brings out some of the shine and the gold paint. And you can see it makes it much clearer that his eyes are completely blacked out, which gives him even more menace than uh, this Skeletor, who's got the, the painted in pupils and whatnot. So yeah, I think this Skeletor is a little creepier. He's uh, just a little different from anything we've seen before. And I think he's absolutely fantastic. And I can pretty much guarantee you, unless 2020 throws me some really awesome, crazy surprises uh, for the rest of the year, I can pretty much guarantee this one's going to make my year-end list because I absolutely love it. So that's my review of the William Stout Collection Masters of the Universe Classics figures. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment. So uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Ciao.